Okay, great. Ah, there we go. Fantastic. Sorry. <laughs> And are, are you happy for me to launch and go ahead or would you like to say anything? No, no, that's perfect. Thank you, Celine. Sorry, I was just, um, there's a couple of people that couldn't attend today, including um, Sarah. So she was just very keen not to miss out and wanted us to record it. So um, yeah. wonderful, wonderful. Well, I love seeing all so many familiar faces. Um, as I was saying, gift yourself as much as possible the gift of being present for the next 55 minutes or so. And the idea is I'm going to cover quite a bit of ground and some of the stuff you know right but we don't need more information we need more time with the same information and remember if all of this was easy we would all be doing a lot more of it it's been you know since we last saw each other at the last presentation in December uh, you may remember what we covered you may not that's okay well-being is something that we do continuously it's a journey right and so today I'm going to take you on a journey specifically through five lessons that I learned myself when I was in Japan at the end of last year. And as I contemplated, what did I learn from my experience? Because it felt like going to Mars. And <laughs> it was so different that I thought, are there things I can bring back? And so there were five things that I've brought back that are helping me. And I'm hoping that one of them, you don't need to leave with all five, can help you to maybe approach 2024 a little bit differently because we need to approach well-being differently uh, because of the pace of change, what's the pressure that's placed on, pl placed on us, the fact that when we are more stressed, when we have more uncertainty, that it does drain us mentally, emotionally, physically. And so having new ways of harnessing energy and helping us stay calmer, despite what's happening around us, can really help a lot. So... I'm curious if there's anything that you currently would like to get out of the session. So I'm going to just pose this question. What would make this the best hour you've spent so far this year? So how could we, how could I answer a particular question that you might be thinking? So if there's anything you want to pop into the chat now, if there's something you're currently doing with your well-being, if there's a particular topic you'd like to hear more about, even though I've come prepared to share with you these five lessons, I would like to weave in anything that you might be prepared to share. So feel free to pop that into the chat and I'll keep my eye on the chat and make sure that I address that. Because I really want you to feel that this was the best investment of your time in a long time. And to help us get the most out of this session and any of your meetings that are coming up the rest of the week, or really anything that you choose to do, the one thing that I learned more about when I went to Japan was how much our posture and our breathing can help our state. So if you want to stay mentally switched on and also stay calm, it's a, a really useful tool to come back to your posture and your breathing. So right now, I invite you, because well-being is about being, you know, we, we can have all the knowledge in our head, doesn't make us well. We need to put this, this stuff into practice. So bring your awareness to your posture, and how are you sitting? Are you a little bit maybe tense and leaning forward and frowning maybe, or lifting your shoulders? We carry a lot of tension and stress in the top part of the body. What would it be like if you allowed your shoulders to drop a little bit towards the ground, what would it be like if you brought your awareness to your spine and let your spine feel upright as if there was a string pulling up in your head, but keeping all your muscles, your shoulders, your neck relaxed? So notice how that feels, that little bit of a shift. And then please bring your awareness to your breath. And what would it be like if you took a little bit more of a deeper, slower inhale on your next in-breath? Perhaps breathing in through your nose, and what would it be like if as you exhale through your mouth, you let that exhale last a little bit longer than usual? And when we do these small techniques, like being aware of our posture and being aware of our breath, it literally gives us options because it sustains our energy and helps minimize the impact of stress. And when we have options, we can do all kinds of things. And this ties into this Eastern proverb, a healthy person has a thousand wishes so a healthy person, we, we can do lots of things, a thousand things. However, a sick person has just one wish. And we've all been there, right? Where we've been poorly for whatever reason. 
either physically, maybe emotionally or mentally. And all we can think about is not having that headache or not feeling that weight of anxiety or not having that particular pain in our back. So today is really, you know, this can be not just a presentation. It can be a life-changing pocket of time. Because if you can take one technique that can help you to feel more relaxed and more at ease in your body, that gives you remarkable return on investment. So like I shared, this journey of well-being is a way of being. We need to practice it. And that's why throughout today, I'm going to give you five opportunities to reflect on questions. It might be helpful for you to have a pen and paper and write it down um, or to commit to coming back to the recording. Although if you like me, I always make these commitments and unless I diarize it as like a meeting, I don't usually come back to them. So I'd really like you to be able to get the most out of today. And thank you, Anna, for sharing in the chat about the overthinking. I'm definitely gonna share a strategy with that. And so, as I said, when I was preparing for this presentation, I thought, how could I make it not just personal and authentic from me, but uh, give you a framework of five things perhaps that you could take into 2024 to help you get more out of 2024 so that you feel less stressed by the end of the year. And when, I, when you think of Japan or the East, I don't know if some of you have traveled there, but we often think of Zen, right? So this is about helping you to feel a little bit more Zen and maybe less zapped because <laughs> a lot of us often feel very tired and fatigued. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at using Japan as an acronym. And we're going to look at joy and how we can harness more joy. We're going to look at awareness, which we've already touched on, because awareness starts with your posture and your breathing and the benefits of that. And then I'd like to share with you this concept of polarity, because when you can hold polarity, you can really hold a lot of stress and tension and change and uncertainty without it negatively impacting your mental, emotional, or physical well-being too much. And then we're going to take a look at abundance, but specifically what abundance means in terms of diet. And I'm going to remind you some of the things that we've already covered on the Wellculator. And then I'm going to end off with the, dare I say, miraculous nature of nature <laughs> and two specific ways that you can harness nature more during 2024. Right, so by the end of the session, we would have covered these five aspects, and I'm going to ask you to choose just one, not all five, just one, and be quite clear on what is something that you can take to cultivate more of that. And then we will have the opportunity to see one another again, and when we see each other again, I will ask you about this particular pledge, and I'm also going to um, go through the Wellculator again. And I think a good topic that we might cover uh, Will and I discussed this, was around managing the digital devices in our lives. So how do you manage all this input? Um, so if that's a topic of interest for you, then I really look forward to seeing you then. But for now, let's start with this concept of joy. And specifically, we're going to look at joy spotting, gratitude, and heart coherence. So those are all three pictures that I took during my journey. Uh, so I went to Japan to walk with my favorite poet, Ten years ago, I discovered David White. He's a, a, he was born in Yorkshire, grew up in Ireland, and now lives um, in the South Pacific, the North Pacific somewhere. And uh, when I saw that him and his wife were walking in Japan and they were inviting 18 people to join them, I was like, I have to be there. I've always wanted to go to Japan, and I love this poet. And so it took me a long time to prepare, but I got to go. And uh, these pictures, all the pictures in the presentation, by the way, come from that experience. We walked for one week on what's called the Nakasendo Trail, which is this beautiful route in the mountains between uh, Kyoto and Tokyo. Uh, yeah, if you ever get a chance to go to Japan, it really is an incredible place of contrast, very different to my experience of growing up and where I've traveled. So this concept of joy, everywhere I looked, there were new things, right? And um, joy spotting is a way of using what's happening in our environment. It doesn't have to be in nature. So literally where you are right now, some of you are in the office, some of you may be at home. Is there 
something in your environment that you can look around that makes you feel a little bit joyful, even just, oh yeah, I like that particular ornament or photograph, or is there a color? Maybe some of you that are looking out a window, you perhaps could see trees or birds. And if you notice anything, please pop that into the chat. Thank you, Jenny, your dog. I think dogs are the best for that. So right now, when you look around, even if you don't find something, the fact that you're looking starts to fire certain neurons in your brain towards more optimism. And those, I'm so delighted that I can see that you've got stuff around you that brings you joy from hot coffee to sun, to cats, to photo of kids, amazing. And then my question is, how can you create more opportunities for joy spotting, especially around your desk or where it is that you choose to work? Like right above this webcam, I've got the flying elephant. I can't show it to you because it's behind the webcam. It's a little wooden flying elephant that I got as a gift four years ago. It brings me so much joy because elephants don't fly, right? But that's not the point. It just makes me happy. So small things like that, that when we notice during the day can remind us potentially to smile. And then when we actively look for things to make us joyful, they it shifts our internal chemistry. So now I'm going to share a piece of research that comes out of Harvard by this author, Sean Acor. He's written a lot around happiness and joy and gratitude. And some of his latest research has shown that when you decide to pause and think about what you're grateful for, you shift your internal chemistry, you reduce the amount of cortisol in your system, you increase oxytocin and dopamine, and you help certain neurons in the learning center open up so you become more creative and open as opposed to what stress does, right? It closes us down and we lose big picture thinking. So I'm not sure if any of you have a particular gratitude practice because it's not always easy to feel joy, especially with the messiness and um, challenge that life brings, you know, just this, this, this journey of being human brings a lot of opportunities to not be joyful. And if we rely on the outer world, like the weather or geopolitical climates or work or people to be a certain way in order to be happy, we might never find that happiness. So it really is an inside job. And what can help us from the inside is to find opportunities to notice things that make us feel joy but also to think about what we are grateful for and to make that a daily practice. So if you've got a family and you sit down for an evening meal, perhaps that will be a good time to practice a bit of gratitude. I tend to, in the morning when I'm having my morning coffee, I like to sit and even if it, I only have three, four minutes, I will think about the day before and I'll try and always think about three things that I've been grateful for. There's something magical about the three things. It's been studied a lot, not just by Sean Acor, but many other people to show that it has a positive impact. Now, I wanted to give you two resources that if you, if you feel drawn to this concept of joy and joy spotting, or maybe you're a bit skeptical, you're like, I don't know, it feels a bit woo-woo to me, and I just don't feel joyful. This is the first resource that I can recommend. It's a TED Talk by Ingrid Fettel Lee called Where Joy Hides and How to Find It. It's a wonderful way to spend uh, 17 or 18 minutes. And she's done a lot of research around in our natural environment, there are things that make humans feel good. So if you would like ideas of what to bring into your desk or your workspace, this TED Talk can give you a lot of ideas around what shapes work, what colors work, what pictures work. It's a really fun, a fun presentation. And perhaps some of you maybe. I don't know if you're managing teams or you want to perhaps as a, as a group, perhaps make a cup of tea or coffee and sit and watch it together and then have a conversation around it. And when we bring together this gratitude or joy and we link it with slow, deep breathing, especially if you do what we call heart-focused breathing. So heart-focused breathing is when you imagine, and you can do this right now for two or three breaths, is as you breathe in, even though you're breathing in through your nose or your mouth, you imagine the air coming in through your heart and as you breathe out, out through your heart. So perhaps try that as I keep on speaking. So inhale and imagine air coming in through the upper part of your chest and as you exhale, out through your chest. And that awareness of bringing your attention to the heart area 
they've measured this. It increases the electromagnetic field around the heart. It's quite phenomenal. We've now got these incredible devices. You know, it's a bit like going to the doctor if you've ever had an ECG, and then that's what they do. They put these little monitors on your chest and they measure the field that your heart is giving off. And your heart literally gets stronger when you slowly breathe in and out and you think of something that brings you joy or something that you love or some kind of gratitude or appreciation. This is a well studied. Uh, concept, especially from the HeartMath Institute. Um, and what it does, those of you might already know about HRV, heart rate variability, and it helps your heart rate variability to increase, which is your internal fitness for stress. It increases your internal resilience to stress. So no matter what happens around you, you could get caught in a traffic jam, you could put on the news and hear terrible news, um, you could experience some kind of personal uh, issue that's difficult. But when you use these techniques of breathing and helping the nervous system, you can still maintain a sense of calm despite what's happening around you. Um, yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, absolutely. Less vacillation, because vacillation is exhausting, right? When we have these highs and lows and highs and lows. So keeping a sense of calm, I think, not I think, I mean, a lot of people are saying it's going to be one of the top trends to see whether people stay resilient, and especially around managing mental health. So if you would like to explore this concept a bit more, I can highly recommend Dr. Joe Dispenza is doing groundbreaking work in this space, using this breathing technique linked to a positive emotion. And his blog has got so much information if you wanted to take a look at that. And then there are also meditations that are available that you can get from him. So we're gonna move on, but we have our first reflection. We've spoken about joy, joy spotting, gratitude, uh, this concept of heart coherence, which is focusing on your heart as you breathe. How will you cultivate more joy or gratitude in 2024? You, you may not know the answer straight away to this. Giving yourself the permission to be curious already opens up that mindset so your subconscious mind can think about it. But if anything comes up, perhaps you want to jot that down or uh, put it into the phone or even put it into the chat. There's something about collective sharing, you know. Thank you, Katie. Being making time to reflect on things to be grateful for or thankful for. That making time for me, anchoring it with my morning coffee has been one of the most powerful things I've done. I now have seven years worth of gratitude. I posted about this last week, um, the 1st of March, 2017, seven years ago, I reflected on what happened that day. And it was so powerful to realize how much has happened since then. So yeah, these little practices that we start over time can bring us a treasure of well-being. Thank you so much for the reflections and shares. I'd like us now to move on to awareness, which we started with right at the start when I asked you, how are you feeling anyway? Like what's happening inside your body? That's bringing a sense of awareness. So this concept of mindfulness can be quite vague. And yeah, it, it helps to meditate and have mindfulness practices. But really, it's about trying to be more mindful every waking moment. So even right now, when you're in this presentation or after this presentation, how you go into your next meeting or how you go into lunch or how you go into your afternoon and how you arrive back home and meet up with the family this evening, are you mindful? Um, and the best definition of mindfulness, because there's many, but the one that I really, really always come back to is this. That, by the way, was one of our guides. We had these two most beautiful human beings that guided us on the walk through the Nakasendo Trail. Um, and he was always right at the back, uh, right at the back, just making sure that nobody got left behind. Uh, he was fitter than most of us. And you can see that he's been younger for longer. <laughs> and he would often sit or stand and simply be in the moment. So this was one of the photos that I captured of him just being in the moment. <laughs> and here's the definition of mindfulness that I feel he really embodies. Being aware of what is happening in the present moment with an attitude of kindness and acceptance. So right now, what is happening? You're listening to me talk. You might be solely focused on this and feeling good and 
grateful and there's a sense of acceptance and kindness, maybe there's a lot going on in your head. And it's easy to get irritated. You know, that inner voice can make us feel irritation. How could you rather see, okay, I've got all this stuff going on. Something happened on the weekend. I've got a big thing coming up this week. I had an argument with somebody this morning and that's okay because that's part of being alive. You know, we seem to have this idea that everything should go well all the time. That is absolutely not what being human is about, <laughs> but it's rather, you know, about being able to vacillate, to use that word, but without losing, I guess, too much of our sense of control. And what can, what can help with this is when, when I started the walk in Japan, right at the beginning on day one, they asked us to write on this board where we're from. And I remember struggling because I was like, am I from the UK or am I from South Africa or am I from France? My entire family live in France. I was born in South Africa. I've now lived for seven years in the UK. And, you know, where's home anyway? <laughs> but it made me reflect on how we can often live in the past or we can live too much in the future. So I remember, I think this was day four. It was so hard to find coffee, by the way, in Japan. Coffee is not a thing. Well, certainly not in the mountains. Green tea and matcha tea, which I think tastes like blended lawn, it's not my thing. That was easy to find. <laughs> but I found coffee. And so I sat and I was planning the next day's routes. And I noticed myself living into towards, oh, day, the last day we had 20 kilometers to walk. And then we were going to end at the Tokyo train station. And I, and I was a little bit anxious about that. And I was like, you know what? Either we live in the past or we live in the future. We often forget about the here and the now. So maybe being aware of that, mindful of when you're thinking too much about things of the past and worrying too much about the future, how could you be more in what's happening right now in this moment? And I know this is easier said than done. <laughs> um, and this can take a lifetime to even just notice how our thoughts are. What can help though, is to give yourself a mindful minute. I don't know if some of you have remembered uh, the first presentation that I did and the second presentation, I gave you this tool of the mindful minute where you set your timer for 60 seconds and you bring your awareness to what's happening inside your body now. And even if you can't do that for a whole mindful minute, could you perhaps give yourself the opportunity at the end of the day to be still? Because I don't know if you agree with the statement, but I really feel this to be true, that your mind will answer most questions if you learn to relax and wait for the answer. But many of us are so busy, we're so rushed, we're so stressed. From the moment we wake up, we engage with our phones uh, all day long, we hardly stop. And when we stop, we're on social media, we're still talking, we're driving, we're doing so much. And then at the end of the day, we can end up feeling really tired, but still so wired that we're not getting the quality rest that we need. And ideally during our day, it's a bit like adding salt and pepper to a meal. If you add a little bit of these moments where you take one deep breath, where you ask yourself, how am I feeling? Where you look around and try and notice things that bring you joy, not just what's happening on the screen in front of you and what's causing you stress, that can help a lot. And to also know why you're doing this well-being or mindfulness stuff, like what is your goal? You know, for a whole year before I went to Japan, I had this intention that I was going to walk with this poet, David White, this man that I had been reading his works that helped me through many difficult times in my life, a divorce, I left a very conservative Christian community, I immigrated from my country of birth, and I found poetry was one of the tools that helped me. And then for a whole year, I walked, I worked on my walking, because I'd never walked with a backpack, but I had this goal in mind. So if we have, if we are going to look to the future, can we choose something positive is what I'm saying, as opposed to just worrying too much about the future, which hasn't happened, you know, and we live in a society that does not make it easy, right, to live in the present moment, because generally we live in a society that encourages fear and scarcity, which is why I choose not to focus on the news, I let the news find me. And that's one way that I manage my own mental health. And this is very personal. You know, that may not work for you, but being aware of what you're projecting into the future can help a lot. So on a positive note of the future, here is your second reflection. Do you have a well-being goal for this year? Is there anything that might make you happy if you achieved or moved more towards 
you know, and, and I'm hoping that it's not just something like, oh, I want to lose weight or, oh, I want to go on holiday, perhaps make it more granular, smaller and more, a little bit more achievable. Um, but doing a long walk, so my goal was to be able to walk 10 to 15 kilometers a day with a backpack. And that really helped me to walk through the summer last year. So I was prepared for this trip. And yeah, getting more good quality sleep. I, I know you're not alone in wanting that. So what can help you with getting more quality sleep potentially? And Anna, I don't know if you remember, I've spoken about this before. This concept of NSDR, non-sleep deep rest, which is a beautiful way to relax the body wherever you are. That's why that chap is fully clothed. <laughs> Ideally, it's helpful to do it lying down. So I know those of you at the office, you may not want to lie down on the floor, but you could go sit somewhere quietly with your earphones. And if you find an NSDR on YouTube, um, some of them are 10 minutes or less. If you would like one from me, because people have said that my voice is soothing, I will gladly share, in fact, I will, as a follow-up note to this presentation, share a link where you can find a nine-minute NSDR that I've done. And then there's longer ones available on many apps and YouTube. And it's a wonderful way to help the brain and the heart relax. It's almost like you've had a power nap without having to actually fall asleep. I love that you're using that almost most days now. Yeah, I can't, when I've, Sometimes I forget just how powerful non-sleep deep rest can be as a meditation. And then when I do it, I'm reminded. So I'm very delighted that you're doing that. If we have time at the end of the presentation, I might do an NSDR, but I'd like to get through the content first and, uh, and then we can see if there's time for that. And please look out for the link if you'd like to have a recording. Can you remember what letter we're moving on to? Yeah, so we're moving on to P, which is polarity. And I'm curious, before I tell you what I'm going to talk about around polarity, what comes up for you when you hear the word polarity? And would you pop that into the chat? When you hear the word polarity or think of polarity, what do you think of? Is there a picture? Is there an item? Is there a concept? What comes up for you? Um, I don't know why. I usually think of a magnet. Chemical atoms. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't exist in the atomic field and quantum physics without polarity between because that's what creates that energy magnets black and white balance approach stabilization gosh there is such wisdom in the collective sharing i love that antarctica <laughs> wonderful so there's a lot we could discuss around polarity right um, i had a wonderful discussion this weekend again because currently i'm talking a lot about the feminine and masculine archetypes and the polarity that they cause, um, but that's a completely different conversation. For today, I would like to link it back to my experience from Japan. And I don't know if any of you are aware of Kintsugi. So Kintsugi is an art form. And I'm gonna tell you in a moment what that is, but to me, it highlights polarity. Polarity for me is also about yes and no. So what do we say yes to? What do we say no to? And that's very important for well-being, especially when we live in a world that wants, to, wants us to say yes to everything and we can't. We can, or you can, but then you potentially don't get the richness of doing less, or you might get to burnout and deflation and feel like you're doing more. And then it's also about being able to express emotions, whether we label them as good or bad, because actually, in my opinion, there's no bad emotions. And in Japan, there's this very strong belief that you cannot be happy or have joy if you are not also sad. And I think that's wonderful. <laughs> In fact, they are related to each other. The happier you are, the more you need to at moments be very, very sad and upset. And I find that quite a balanced view of things. So this concept of kintsugi, um, so I used to do a lot of mosaic art and I loved taking ceramics and breaking them into pieces or tiled and then creating a design and putting it together. It was one of my favorite things to do. I haven't done it much over the last six or seven, seven years. But I will take it up again when, when the time is right. And so when I discovered that in Japan, they have this art form called kintsugi, is when something is broken, you know, if a ceramic jar or a bowl or a plate or a vase is broken, instead of throwing it away or perhaps breaking it even more, like I would do and make a mosaic design, they take it to a kintsugi master 
it takes almost 10 years, by the way, to become a Kintsugi master. I met one by accident. It was a beautiful afternoon in Kyoto. And um, he couldn't speak a word of English. I couldn't speak a word of Japan besides saying, I've got his story, I've got his story, which is thank you. No, that's thank you in Greek. See how the mind works. <laughs> origamas, origamas is thank you in J Japanese. <laughs> and um, he showed me these artifacts that he had put together with gold lacquer. And they use gold lacquer to actually highlight the cracks in the artifact. And anything that has gone through this art form of Kintsugi is of higher value than the original artifact, even if it was a priceless vase worth thousands of Japanese zen <laughs> or pounds. If it's put together by a Kintsugi master with this gold lacquer, it is esteemed of higher value because it is no longer perfect. I'm just going to say that again. It is esteemed of higher value because it is no longer perfect, because the imperfections are highlighted and brought out. And that ties in with this Japanese approach to when we are sad or upset or angry, we, they do not suppress those emotions. It is important to express them and everything is welcome. So when you are not feeling perfect, because we aren't, um, how do you allow yourself to express those emotions and perhaps even feel that you are more beautiful, of more value by being imperfect? And we can start with ourselves doing that, but of course we can extend this concept of kintsugi to others as well when they are potentially imperfect. And everyone's imperfect, right? If somebody pulls in front of you and they upset you or somebody pushes into the queue or a colleague maybe just does something that doesn't make you feel good, how could you rather look at them from a place of mindfulness? Do you remember the definition of mindfulness? Is accepting what's happening in the current moment with kindness, but also just feeling like we're all just imperfect and everyone's doing the best they can with what they have and where they are. Yeah, that helps me a lot, especially with strangers. I just assume everyone's doing the best they can with what they have and where they are, because we don't know what people are dealing with. We get very caught up in our own head, remember our own past, our own future, our own lives, but people are struggling. And so if we could be a little bit more kind and accepting, could our life be a little bit easier? And this concept of Kintsugi is part of that. Another example of how I experienced where we just don't know what's going to happen and things can be out of our control was a uh, the same afternoon that I met the Kintsugi master, I was walking in the streets of Kyoto. I was starving hungry and I wasn't sure where to go and eat. And so I saw this restaurant and I peeped in under the, I forgot the name of what those curtains are, but every single place in Japan has these beautiful drapings outside the door and there's a some symbolic meaning for them. And I peeped in, I was like, okay, I think I'm going to go eat there. And in the window, I spotted those little bowls with the egg. And I thought, okay, great. I'm going to point to what I want. Um, so I pointed to the one that I wanted. And I was like, oh, well, she's going to come and cook the stir fry. And I sat at this table. There was this heated plate. And then she brought me the dish, which looked exactly like what was in the window. And I was like, okay, I'm going to start cooking this. I actually poured that dish onto the hot plate. And she came running back. And she was, no, 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 no. And she was like speaking in, in Japanese and she scooped all the stuff up. And, and she was like, no. And then she made me understand that she was serving me and I needed to not do anything myself. Maybe it's a South African in me. Like you put a hot plate in front of me or a fire and you give me food. Like I'm going to barbecue, right? Like I'm it's just the way I'm wired. <laughs> so I sat back and I'm like, oh, okay, I'll let her do it. And then she created a dish that I would never have created for myself. She mixed this beautiful bowl up in, I, I don't know how she did it. She did like this chopsticks thing and then the egg got mixed in, into it. And then she created this like large flat cake for tartar. And then instead of offering me salt and pepper, which I thought was cool, she offered me these herbs on the side, these dried herbs. Um, and I just said yes to everything, everything when it came to food in Japan. And then she kept on cooking it and eventually sliced this beautiful dish and it got served steaming hot with this. It was the most delicious thing I've eaten in a long time. And I was just so amused because I thought I was going to get a stir fry with maybe a fried egg on top. And I ended up getting this whole different experience. And isn't that what life does? We can have all the perfect ingredients. Everything's lined up. We think we know exactly what we're doing. We try and take control over the situation. And life has a way of coming in 
and just making us surrender. <laughs> and this is the concept of polarity, right? Even when you have everything set and planned and you think it's going to work out, it might not work out the way you planned. But what if instead of getting uptight and judgmental and critical, what if you imagined it to be kintsugi? Where is the gold in this, this imperfection? And perhaps that could help you this year to accept more contrast because that's what polarity is for me, right? It's contrast. So how could you, as your third reflection, how could you practice holding more polarity in 2024? Could it be by thinking about this art of kintsugi? Um, I know that some people are doing a lot of like cold showers. That's a physical way to manage contrast going from cold or hot. Um, it could be using some breathing techniques where you hold your breath perhaps, or you do what we call breath work. Maybe you could do a new type of sport or like I'm keen to learn tango this year. And that's going to create a lot of contrast for me because it's something completely new and I will get it wrong. I mean, I did. I, I tried to tango on Friday night because I went to a dance social and I was, I, I caught myself getting annoyed and I was like, breathe, breathe, stay relaxed, stay relaxed, keep the enjoyment. Yeah. So there's many ways, you know, that we could maybe practice this contrast and holding polarity uh, so that we don't take ourselves so seriously and expect things to not always work out. And maybe there's magic. Maybe, maybe, maybe you get the most delicious frittata that you've ever had in your life because it didn't work out the way you wanted it to. Now, abundance, which is the second A in Japan, is all about food. And when I was in Japan, the food was incredible. So on the left-hand side at the bottom of that slide, um, and the top, well, actually all three of those are pictures of different breakfasts that I had. Breakfasts. I don't know if you've had breakfast this morning. Did you have anything like that? <laughs> Probably not. But there's a reason why. There are parts of the Japanese culture, especially in Okinawa, it's an island, where they live the longest on planet Earth. It's one of the longevity hotspots, the blue zones. And it's partly because of the variety in their diet. Because the more variety you have in your diet, the healthier your gut, the stronger your immune system, the longer you live. It's very simplified, but that's what's happening. So I'm not suggesting that you eat seaweed and fish and squid and all kinds of different miso soups and fermented products for breakfast. But how could you be more curious about eating more variety? Has anybody, by the way, been on the Zoe program? And if you have, would you pop a yes into the chat? So the Zoe program, really, I know that it's booming in the UK and lots of people are on it. And it makes you very aware of your gut microbiome and how many variety of fruits you, uh, foods you eat and what foods are good for you. There's a strong focus on, on gut health. So if you haven't done the program and you're interested in understanding more about how your body responds to food, I can highly recommend it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really good. And you get a lot of information. And even if you don't go on the program, their podcast is super interesting. So Dr. Tim Spector shares a lot of information. The latest one is all about coffee. Is coffee good for you? Is it not? If it matters, by the way, the good news is that it is actually good for you. And interestingly, it even contributes a little bit of fiber to your diet. So the, what we know, though, is the more variety of foods you eat, the more likely you are to have better gut health. And ideally, we should be eating 30 different plant-based foods in a week. So let me just actually, I'm going to copy and paste that into the chat. And that's what the Zoe program actually helps you measure. So plant-based foods are any foods that come from plants, right? So here's an example on the, on the slide. So all your fruits, all your vegetables. And I did a whole presentation specifically on eating like an artist and being more strategic around the way that you refuel. Uh, and even if that means starting off with one or two new foods in your diet that you use usually don't, and what can help you with that is inspiration with recipes. And if you haven't already, because if you did not attend the presentation that I did around eating like an artist and gut health, you might not have seen the PDF that I shared, you're welcome to contact me or be, please make sure to look out for the thank you notes after today. 
and I will include, I put together a little PDF called How to Eat Like an Artist. And there are two resources in there that can perhaps be very helpful for you to help get more of an abundance in your diet so that you can help your gut health and your immunity. So there's a page, I think it's the second or third last page in the PDF. And there I share one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different ways that you can eat more colorful foods. And maybe you can just choose one of them, like soup or making healthy smoothies. Now that spring and summer's on our doorstep, or how could you maybe make your own spreads and dips instead of always buying the same tzatziki or salsa or guacamole or hummus at the store? We tend to eat quite a monotonous diet because we go to the same shops and buy the same things. So that page can maybe give you some inspiration of how do you bring in more abundance into your diet. But so too could the list that I call the rainbow food list. So I've put together, it's not an infinite list. There's many more options, but here are a group of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, beige, or brown foods to show you that there is a lot of variety out there. You know, herbs and spices and all the plants and vegetables. And if you can, over a week, expose your gut to 30 different fruits, vegetables, herbs, and spices. And it sounds like a lot, but what if... You decide to have, if I go to the previous slide, if you have a stir fry, so tonight you decide Monday, meat free, let's go for a vegetable based meal, let's make a stir fry. If you were making a stir fry, I don't know about you, but you would probably, I would use red cabbage, maybe even white cabbage, that's two, carrots, one pepper at least, maybe some sugar snap peas and sweet corn. Would I add anything else to that? Maybe mushrooms. So there I've got seven vegetables with maybe some beautiful fresh herbs in one dish. And if you have a lovely maybe portion of like four fistfuls, you've exposed yourself to seven vegetables and half your daily quota for plant-based foods in one meal. So that's why having more plant-based meals, if you do that three or four times in the week, and you're eating many more than three or four times, you're probably eating 20, 21 times a week. So that's how we can get to this number and this variety without it feeling like I have to turn into a vegan because you don't need to do that. So the second last reflection, how will you eat more like an artist this year? So how will you eat more like an artist? If you feel that that's something that you want to do, be sure to look at the PDF or maybe um, I also do a weekly recipe. So five ingredients or less, you can sign up for that on my website or get yourself a, a new recipe book or get one of those food boxes like Mindful Chef delivered once a month and find ways to inspire you on how to eat more like an artist and get more color into your diet because it may just help you to live longer and have quality of life in those years because that's what we're seeing with these longevity hotspots. Right, we're on to the last letter of Japan, which is nature. Now we know nature is good for us, right? And um, I think most of us have probably had the experience of walking through a forest, uh, maybe seeing a big lake or piece of water, or may maybe you get to go to the ocean or even just spending time in your garden. Or maybe I know whenever I walk up into my kitchen on the kitchen window sill, I've got a beautiful selection of orchids. Uh, I can't grow orchids anywhere else except in the kitchen. Don't know what it is, but when they're there, I've got an orchid that's been with me for almost five years now, which is unknown because I used to, I'm, I'm not really a green thumb kind of person. So in Japan, the doctors for a long time, this is finally happening now in the West, but the doctors would prescribe Describe something called forest bathing for people who had anxiety or depression. And forest bathing is where you go into the forest. You usually would go with a guide who would take you through a process of using your senses. So looking at the different colors, smelling the different smells, touching the bark and the leaves and the soil, feeling the air temperature and how the leaves crush beneath your feet. Um, and even when I did a forest bathing experience in Japan with a guide, she got us to taste the air and she knew what to pick and she picked one or two leaves and she said, just bite this. So we really used our whole senses. 
And I mean, the research is there. It's just nature soothes your nervous system. Um, so how could you spend more time in nature? There's also something very powerful around seeing open horizons. So when you look at an open horizon, it increases your perspective and helps to shift your mindset. And generally, if I think of where you're based and the office and your home, I'm making an assumption that you've got access to open spaces. If I go to London and I work with a client in London or in a city that's quite built up, it's not always easy for people to see open spaces. Um, so don't take it for granted if you have the ability to walk to an outcrop or to look over a certain hill. One of my friends sent me a photo this morning. He was driving over the South Downs from Worthing to Farnham to get to work. And it was this incredible panorama of the sun rising over the South Downs. It was beautiful. And he said there were about a dozen people that stopped on the side of the road to take a photograph. And I was like, that's amazing. They're all doing the open horizon, which is helping their mind. It literally changes your neurochemistry when you look at an open horizon. It makes you feel like you have more options. That's why when we spend time in nature, or if we open up our view and look up away from our computers, we can actually problem solve and have creative thinking. So on that note, thinking of nature, because it's very personal, right? I'm curious, do you know where your favorite spot is? Whether it's realistic or not, because it might be a place that you haven't been to in a long time. Maybe it's a place you used to go to as a child. Maybe it's the garden you grew up in. Maybe it is your own garden. Or if you could be anywhere right now in nature, if you could be anywhere, where would you be? And I'm going to invite you to take your eyes off the screen just for a moment. We're, we're going to do this for about two minutes. Maybe drop your gaze down. If you're comfortable, you can actually, you can close your eyes and take yourself to your ideal place in nature. It might be a mountain. It might be a valley. It might be near a body of water. It may be leaning against a tree. It could be in your garden. It could be in somebody else's garden. It could be the Avatar movie or Wonderland, anywhere in nature. There's no judgment, except everything with kindness. And I'd like you to spend a minute there. What can you see? What colors can you see? What happens when you look up? So if you're in a forest and you look up, you can often see the sun coming through the leaves. If you're at a bed of water and you look up, you might see clouds in the sky. If you are in outer space or Wonderland, what happens if you look up? Do you see fairies? and it's like psychedelic patterns and yeah, it's all welcome. It's, it's your place of nature. What can you hear? What sounds can you hear? Are there animals, birds? Is there silence? What can you feel as you're sitting or standing or floating in this nature? Maybe you're floating in warm water in the ocean. So you can hear the sound that water makes when you're underwater. Maybe you can hear somebody laughing, birds chirping. What can you feel, the temperatures, the textures? Is there any taste? Maybe there's a taste of freshness or maybe has some just moisture or maybe there's a fruit. Can you smell anything? Is there flowers or bark or soil? Maybe it is just neutral and you're just taking in a deep breath. Yeah. And if your eyes are closed, I invite you to slowly open them and let, let the light back in. Yeah, you've always got access to nature. I mean, ideally going there in person is really good for your, your body. Um, but some, sometimes we can't always go. We can always use our imagination, you know. So when I was in Japan and we did the forest bathing experience, this was, this was the group. I took a photo as we started a moment of mindfulness. And there was the sign in the forest, you know, talking about the benefits of how it increases NK cells and boosts immunity. And yeah, you don't have to be in a forest. The idea is to be in nature. So if you can access nature more this year, and if you can potentially access horizons, especially if you're feeling very stressed and overwhelmed, going to a place where you can see a panoramic view, even if it's only once a month, 
um, and allow yourself to be away from your screens, away from life, everything that draws us in and let your mind think. You might be surprised at what comes up for you. Yeah, so David White, the poet, spoke a lot about the neuroscience of horizons and how as a poet, when he gets stuck and blocked, he will go walking and look for open places and look for inspiration that way. So this is the, the, the last reflection, but actually you're going to do one more reflection because there's going to be, I'm going to ask you to just commit to one thing. But the last reflection is, how could you do forest bathing or nature bathing? So spend time in nature or go and find open horizons more in 2024. Yeah, I recently, four months ago, I moved to Western Supermare, which is south of Bristol. Uh, and I'm committed to spending more time walking on the estuary, which, by the way, is the second largest tidal change in the world. The first one is in Mexico. So when I go there and I notice either the tides in or out, it just reminds me of the awesome power of nature. And I allow myself to look at the horizon, see the tide, and let things go and be carried out to the tide that I don't want to carry. So we've journeyed quite a bit and we're going to be coming towards a close. And I'd like you to leave with a really clear idea of what is something practical that you can take from today. So we went through joy, the concepts of joy spotting and creating our own internal happiness and gratitude through a gratitude practice, through noticing things around us that make us joyful or through heart coherence, which is that heart focused breathing. And I shared with you two resources if you'd like to explore more. The TED Talk by Ingrid Fettel Lee called Where Joy Hides and How to Find It. And then the Joe Dispenza website, which speaks more about this heart coherent breathing, how you can do it. If you want to, you can buy some of the meditations. So there's a wealth of information there. Then we went through mindfulness which starts with awareness. How am I? How are you? And how you are in the moment. So instead of being worried in the past, where you're coming from, what's happened, what's going to happen. And when you're in that moment, to try and be kind with whatever's happening. You could be angry, upset, tense, tired, running late. How can you be in the present moment with acceptance and kindness? And then we spoke about polarity. So how can we hold contrast in life? And the beautiful art form of kintsugi, when those dishes are cracked and instead of throwing them away, put things back together with gold so that you feel more valuable, even though you might be imperfect, which we all are. And then we spoke about abundance, specifically abundance in our diet, so that it helps with gut health and immunity so that we can live longer with better quality of life. Uh, and there's many different ways we can always potentially add more variety to our diet. And then I ended with nature, specifically the concept of forest bathing, which is around using your senses in a natural setting or seeing open horizons. So that's quite a bit, right? Like we've covered at least 10, maybe 15 different concepts in, in that. That's too much for you to take away. If you're going to take action and put this well-being into being, into action, I would like you to commit to one thing. So which of these five lessons, joy, awareness, polarity, abundance, nature, do you feel actually that can add value to my well-being this year? And what is one small action you can take? I've spoken about the importance of taking small, small steps. Consistency is better than intensity. So how will you make this one action easy and obvious to do? And if you're happy to share in the chat, there's something powerful about a public declaration, but also powerful for me to see what, have you, what are you going to take from the session? So I'll give you a moment to think about that. And is there something that you would like to do around either joy or awareness or polarity or abundance or nature and how can you take an action on ideally today or tomorrow? Like the sooner you act on something, the better, because then you create that momentum, right? And that gives you positive reinforcement. And please know that I am just an email away. So I'm going to share a thank you note when I get the recording for today with the slides. I will attach the link so that if you'd like to go download that non-sleep deep rest relaxation that I've done, you can get that. 
I've also attached the Eat Like an Artist guide. I've also got a guide on forest bathing. So I will attach that too. And you can respond if you have any questions. I'm one of your well-being partners. If I don't have the answer, I'll do my best to find the answer for you because collectively we can help each other. And especially as a team, you know, at CIWM, like this well-being is such an important part of the culture. Um, and I think it's wonderful that you're here and committed to yourself. And hopefully this can help you create a common language together that you can help support one another through this year so that you feel more zen and less zapped. That's the ideal, I think, is if we can get through 2024, no matter what's happening in the business or in our personal life or outside of everything, how can you stay a little bit more zen and feel less zapped at the end of the year? Because there's a lot of change coming. Life as we know it is going to change so quickly over the next few years. <laughs> and we can get freaked out by that or we can approach it with the way that we approach joy, awareness, polarity, abundance, and nature. Nature shows us that cycles are so important. So thank you. Um, yeah, I've shared that I'm here to serve you. I'm extending a helping hand, so feel free to reach out. And um, yeah, if anybody wants to stay on and ask a question or two, please do. Otherwise, I want to say thank you for your time. Thank you for the shares that are coming up, uh, going through nature, through bike rides, daily gratitude and changing your internal narrative. Um, that's a big thing. That, that could take a lot longer than just 2024. So be patient. Yeah. And you can always come back to the recording. So perhaps before you go into your next meeting, set an hour in your diary to watch it. That might be a great commitment. Thank